Hey, folks. Good morning. Glad to see everybody. Glad you're here. Good crowd in, and especially Peggy. Hey, Peggy, how you doing? How's life at PayPal? Good to see Peggy in here, and Veronica, and Siddhar, and everyone else. Hey, everybody. Glad you're here. Um, I got some new LED lights. Hence, I look beautiful today. Not really. I need a tan. That's that's. Thank you, COVID, for that. Glad to have everybody in. Make sure you click on that share button down there, send this out to your network, smack in some emojis, let everybody know you're here. And we do have a lot to talk about, so I don't wanna waste a lot of time. Why don't we just dive right in? Folks, make sure you grab your coffee. This one's gonna be fun. And with that, why don't we start? Uh, good morning, everyone. If you don't know, my name is Sam All. Welcome to episode 123 of the 11FS FinTech Insider Breakfast Show, 123 episodes. Damn. That's how long COVID's been going on, folks, because we started this in April, thanks to COVID. So here we are, 123 episodes later. In this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight into your homes here on LinkedIn Live. Um, I do this twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. And then we get a crew from London to do the other days at like 3.30 in the morning. So if you can't sleep on the East Coast, you're in luck. You could watch this here. I also want to highlight the 11FS Daily Brief here on LinkedIn. Every morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we post a short video summarizing three news stories from the past 24 hours. That caught our attention and should have yours. So, for example, today's breakfast brief, I talked about Credit Suisse launching their own version of a challenger bank. I talked about Martha Stewart and CBD. That story still makes me laugh. And actually a lot about the U.S. and temporary visas and its, and its impact. So, worth going out taking a look at. Um, I also did... Uh, a review of the Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, and gave my thoughts on it. So with all that, why don't we get our guest in today? I'm thrilled to be joined by Adam Carson, Adam K. Carson, operating partner at Point72 Ventures. On today's show, we've taken a look at how Point72 Ventures are investing in companies that are transforming the global financial services industry. Hello, Adam. How are you? Hey, Sam. How are you doing? Doing Is good. Is San Francisco orange this morning or normal? Uh no, we're great, but we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen the blue since the orange, so uh, <sighs> the air is uh, still bad. Everybody's still stuck inside, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hey, Peggy, I know you're on. Did you ride your bike this morning? Peggy rides your bike everywhere, folks. If you didn't know that, so I'd love to see if she was out and about. Oh, and S Selena, hello, good to have you, and Corey LeBlanc out in Louisiana. Yeah, I love the uh, the guy that did the drone video of San Francisco and to put it to the Blade Runner music. That was just. Freaking fantastic, folks. If you haven't seen that, we'll I'll make sure I put a link out there so y'all can see it. Um, Adam, Adam, have you always been out in San Francisco? I don't even know that. No, actually, uh, I grew up on the East Coast outside of Philadelphia. Um, I started my career in New York working for Morgan Stanley. And then uh, post-business school, I made the, uh, made the trek out to the West Coast. So I've been in San Francisco for uh, just over a decade now. Okay, so you're, you're basically broken in then out there so you're good yeah you've had a you've had a pretty cool career man morgan stanley bain ebay chase that's not bad it's good names uh yeah maybe collecting logos i'm not sure for what but uh <laughs> it's, it's been a, it's been a fun run that's for sure uh I, I i definitely this is this is my first entrepreneurial experience working for um a small company although i, I guess you can't really call 0. 0.72 small uh -huh. but compared to jp morgan um it, it, it definitely feels a lot smaller yeah, I mean, I, 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 if I remember right, at point seventy two, isn't it? Don't you have like a thousand employees? I think. Yeah, I think there's something around fifteen hundred, or yeah. certainly more than a thousand employees. Although, the team I'm on, the fintech team at point seventy two Ventures, is um, you know less than ten people, and so it, it feels like a, a really small organization because we kind of have our own our own little uh, bubble going on a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it, you know, it's it's one of those. We're going to talk a lot about point seventy two, obviously, um, and the fintech space. It's it's a fascinating company because when you look at it, um, you know, one of your founders is, is Stephen Cohen, so he's basically a hedge fund uh, legend. Um, and I think I had asked you how involved he is, and uh, I think you said pretty much every company that you look at, y'all do get in front of him and 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 a group to talk through them, right? Yeah, uh, Steve is actually on our investment committee and uh, approves every deal that we do. And so he's he's extremely involved in, in ventures uh, in addition to running the hedge fund. So what's it like going from, I mean, your last stint, you're at Chase. 
And I, and, and again, as a VC, I like the fit, right? Because you're always in kind of the business strategy side of the house when you're working in financial services. How, what's the transition been like working in for a, a venture firm? Yeah, so when I was at Chase, I was in the um, digital and fintech strategy and partnerships team. Um, that's a mouthful, but essentially it meant that we were working with all the different lines of business and, and working with all the different functions on um, what's next from a customer experience perspective and who are we going to partner with to make that happen, assuming that we weren't going to build everything. And so I spent time with all the different lines of business, with the credit card and the mortgage, with the deposit bank, the small business bank, um, you know, with the, with the auto lending, uh, and then with all the functions, with the digital team, with the marketing team, with the operations team, with the risk team. And there's so much innovation in financial services that that we, you know, we're always looking to the outside to sort of help drive the roadmap back then. And that put me in a position of meeting lots of different startups. Um, some of them were competing with Chase. Some of them were looking for banking services from Chase. Some of them were looking to sell into Chase. There was sort of the, the full gamut of, of companies. And, uh, you know, part, partly my job was to understand like which ones were real and which ones were good. And so I spent a lot of time meeting these companies and I would, I would look at the company and say, you know, does this founder know what they're talking about? Um, are they solving a, an interesting problem and have they, have they built a great product? Um, that was sort of my lens. Um, and I think that the biggest difference in moving into the investing world is those three things still hold true, but now there's this really big fourth bucket, which is, uh, is it a good investment <laughs> uh, that, that needs to go along with the, the first three? So I think um, I'm still working in fintech. I'm still working with a lot of uh, startups, um, both the disruptors of the financial services and the ones that are disrupting financial technology. But there is, um, you know, the, the part that I am learning still is all around the investment and what makes a, what makes a great investment versus just uh, what, what's a cool company and a cool product. You know, when we use the term fintech, man, it is it is so broad at this point, right? I mean, every God, it feels like every month it keeps changing, it keeps moving into new spaces. So, what areas do you kind of focus in on for point seventy two? Because I mean, we could sit here all day and talk about different different components of fintech, but what areas yeah, do you focus I, in on the most? I mean, I, I agree with you with fintech. I, I have trouble keeping up and I've been doing this for 10 years. And, it, you know, every time I turn around, there's some new area of fintech. Um, and that's just sort of pure down the pipe fintech. You talk about insure tech and prop tech yeah. and all these things that are sort of related and the world gets big. To be honest, I don't know how a generalist investor knows how to invest in fintech because it does require such sort of deep domain expertise. Um, so here's the way I see it, Sam. Uh, when I was at Chase, we saw this first wave of what I call disruption of financial services. You'll remember the wealth fronts and the lending yeah. clubs and the on decks and sort of all these companies that came out and basically said banks are going to die and we're going to take over the world. And, you know, they, they brought fully digital experiences into financial services um, and they did and they have disrupted some of financial services from a customer experience perspective. There's no doubt about that. So I think that was sort of wave one and that's one of the areas that we invest in. Um, we, we invest in disruption of financial services. Uh, the second sort of big wave, and I, and I don't think the, maybe wave's the wrong analogy, maybe it's sort of a layer because that first wave yeah. doesn't go yeah. away. We still see companies today that are, that are being born to disrupt the financial services. But the second wave was around disrupt what we call disruption of financial technology. So in this case, we have the big incumbent financial technology players, the FISs, the Fiserv's, the Black Knights, the Broadridges. These are essentially all the companies powering the banks and financial institutions. And there was a whole host of companies that said, you know, they were startup, but they were venture backed, but they said, we're not going to compete with the banks. We're actually here to sell them software. We're here to power their innovation. Um, and so we, we started investing in, in that, uh, that layer of financial services. And we're getting to a point where there's sort of an emerging new, what I'll call third layer. I don't know if I have a great name for it yet, but it consists of a few different pieces. Um, one is sort of, a, I'll call it developer platforms in financial services. 
Uh, so it's not necessarily selling into banks. In this case, uh, these tools are selling either into other fintechs or they're selling into non-banks right now to provide financial services. Uh, and so, yeah, fintech selling into fintechs. Uh, you, some people are calling it embedded finance. Um, we had a name for it a while ago called finance at the edge. But it's just this general nature that financial services are going to be everywhere and that there's a whole new set of infrastructure that is API based and cloud ready that is selling into both fintechs and non-financial institutions. And so uh, at Point72 Ventures, we're sort of uh, investing along the whole spectrum of those three. Um, one might just say financial services are being disrupted. The manufacture of financial services, the distribution of financial services, the access to financial services, and we're playing along all of those dimensions globally. You know, I was listening to, I think it was a podcast by A16, right? Um, uh, and it was interesting. They were they were talking about um, San Francisco and kind of how it grew up, you know, in the gold rush. And what was fascinating are the companies that and the individuals that really made a fortune and are still around as a result of the gold rush weren't the ones that were panning for gold. It was Levi Strauss who made tents, right? You know, it was Wells Fargo. Um, it you know, uh, it's 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 the folks who were actually selling the the shovels and the pans, right, and servicing the industry itself. That's why I like Adam. I like the layer analogy that you gave, and that the interesting companies. And I agree with you right now. I think the interesting companies are those that are providing the services back into the fintech companies and to the banks themselves. I, I, I agree with you. It's hard, man. Here, here's me. If I was a, um, if I was a startup founder and this advice I always give is, you know, are you, are you direct the consumer or are you B2B? Are you a solution provider? And I tend to like the other one better. Direct to consumer is hard. I, I think it's one of the, the most important questions for a startup founder and, I've seen too many times the, the you know, either you try and go direct to consumer because that's, that's sexy, that's cool. A lot of people want to have their technology directly and their brand directly in the hands of end users. Um, that's also really hard and it takes a lot of money to acquire customers and financial services. Um, and so I've seen those, a lot of those companies try and pivot. And, you know, you want to do that as early as possible, because once you build your own brand and once you build your own technology for yourself and once you build your marketing team, sort of saying, oh, I, I want to sell the banks or I want to be a white label platform. It requires an entire sort of operation to your company. You're, you're no longer marketing. You're in sales. Your technology needs to be integrated into others. It's not just for yourself. Um, you don't really care about building a brand in the same way. Um, I've also seen startup founders try and do both of those things at the same time, and uh, that has not worked either. And so I think, um, you know, advice to founders is pick your poison. Uh, and if you're really going to go after this direct to consumer opportunity, uh, you know, don't think the backup plan is, oh, I'll just partner with a bank or I'll sell it into financial services. That hasn't worked out so well for most companies. Yeah. I'm, I'm, again, I, I love your background. Um, do y'all love how much I'm kissing up to Adam right now? Um, it's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll like, I'll, um, say something. Yep. You, you have no pictures on your walls, Adam. How's that? There's my critique. Dude, <laughs> come on, man. Like one, just one. I'm going to send you a poster. <laughs> He's been locked inside. He's in San Francisco. This poor guy hasn't wow. been out since like freaking March. Sorry, dude. Um, but I do, I love your background because you, you, you come out of, you know, it's Morgan Stanley. It's Chase. Um, but also Bain, right? Um, it's, um, you know, I'm in consulting and I'll flat out say it. Bain's incredibly good um, consulting firm to work with. But I love the experience factor that you're able to bring for the startups and, and the founders and talk to them because you've seen, you know, both sides of the coin, if you will. Yeah, actually, that's one of the things that we are, um, that we're trying to differentiate here at Point72 Ventures on the FinTech team. Um, we're yeah. trying to differentiate basically in three ways. One, um, with our expertise, you know, because we're financial services only, and because we all of our backgrounds in financial services, just bringing that sort of, that knowledge to, to the party. The second is we've built a really large network of um, financial institutions that we're out there talking with every day. Um, I think we did 1500 meetings with banks, um, with fintech companies, with lenders, asset managers, uh, 
And you know, the point there is to understand what problems need to be solved, what problems are being solved, and we then turn around and use that same network to help us with due diligence. And we use that same network to then introduce to our portfolio companies once we do make investments. Uh, and then the, the third thing is really about like, what do we do after we invest in a company? And that's where I spend a lot of time. That's where some of the consulting background does come in. We're working with our portfolio companies on their hardest challenges. Um, and you know, one of the things that I spend a lot of time with is for those companies that are selling into banks um, or, or this new wave of sort of fintech selling into fintechs, how do you best position yourself? How do you best go to market? How do you best message your um, service? And uh, how do you segment your, um, how do you prioritize your segments? These are all sort of like go to market motions that a lot of companies at the series A um, seed and series A level need a lot of help with. And so we do spend a lot of time with our companies um, trying to trying to help them be the best they can. And, and I do think that that background and consulting sort of falls naturally into into how I go about that, that that work. Adam, I mean, we've we've both been doing this for a while. Um, I mean that in a good way. Um, and what I mean by that, we've, we've watched fintech evolve, right? Coming out of 2008, and I know we could sit here all day and argue about there was fintech before that. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's not that it's <laughs> APIs have been around forever. Get off your high horse, everybody. I get it. Um, oh my God, I saw a, I saw a headline today from one of the I won't name the publication, but one of the fintech publications talking about how banks need to embrace APIs. And I'm like, Jesus, shoot! <laughs> if we are still having that headline, I give up. Um, but I'm I'm curious, Adam. Just a little spec. Let's look over the past decade. All right. Um, how would you, what grade would you give? And this is hard. I'm generalizing probably too much, but as you look at the different waves or the different layers of FinTech, the integration between banks and the FinTechs or the FinTechs stepping up and taking over a space, what kind of grade would you give them? Like for example, um, you know, Stripe and Square get an A from me <laughs> for, yep. obvi for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. I give Plaid a, um, I give Plaid a B plus. Um, well, they've done well. You know? I mean, I think you know one can't really argue against how well the large banks, at least in the United States, um, have adjusted to digital. Right? Yes. Um, you're seeing Bank of America and Chase and Wells with all with 30 million, 40 million plus active users. Um, and they're still sort of king of the pile there. So from that perspective, I think that they've actually done well, especially given that they, you know, it's when I got to Chase in, in 2012, there wasn't, there was a really small digital team. They, they didn't have the expertise in building mobile apps. I mean, no one really did at the time, but it, it was all new. And, and so I think that they've adjusted. Um, I think the really small banks, the community banks, uh, the, the, you know, it, that's been really difficult because they do rely so heavily on their technology partners. And yeah. most of those technology partners are incumbents. And so there's a big opportunity there for startups to come and serve those smaller banks and medium sized banks because they don't build everything themselves and they just don't have the, you know, 50,000 people in IT that a JP Morgan Chase does. Yeah. That being said, I think that that's sort of, you know, let, that's one view. The other view is that banks are still banks and they are continuing to get, let's say slowly eaten away by technology companies. Mm -hmm. And it could be pure FinTech companies, like you mentioned, like the, the squares and the stripes of the world that are gaining market share in different areas. It could be the neo banks, which you wouldn't argue that any single one of them is a threat, but you add them all together and they, they starting to take share. Um, especially if you include, you know, PayPal, Venmo, and the Cash App in there from Square, right? That, that's some significant scale. And uh, you know, people always overestimate how fast things change in financial services, right? I mean, you go back to the classic sort of NFC adoption, and what are we still? Maybe COVID has pushed it from ten percent adoption to twenty percent adoption, but change in financial services takes a long time. You know, people aren't just all of a sudden taking their retirement savings and, and dumping it into a robo advisor that all these things take time. And uh, I would say that banks as a whole 
have still underinvested in transfer digital transformation and becoming technology companies. They could have moved faster. I, Given I, how I much agree. they've been spending on branches and physical and call centers, they just yeah. haven't been investing as heavily as they needed to, in my opinion, in online and, and mobile and digital. And I, I understand why. I saw it from the inside. But I do think that um, as a whole, financial services is sort of sitting right there in the innovator's dilemma. Here's, and I agree with you 100%. I mean, my thought is um, when you look at the US in particular, I'm going to take the US and, and do a lens on, on this market. When you have such a mature and deeply entrenched system as we have here, it, you know, to think that we're going to see massive change come in um, and disruption, um, I, I don't think it's surprising that we haven't seen something like an M PESA here, you know, because it, 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 this, we're way too mature to the system is there. You're not going to leapfrog. And I used to give for, I'm going to call them out bank of America. So much shit, everybody back in the day, I don't, Adam, I don't know if you remember, but bank of America's mobile app used to be horrific. Oh my God. It was horrible. You'd click on like the T's and C's and you just sit here and scroll, you know, for literally just endlessly to go through them. And now you look at it and you're like, well done, big four, all of them. Good job. Top yeah, 10. They're good. Good job. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, I don't expect them to be disrupted by, you know, Chime or or Borrow or others, but community banks, um, you know, smaller banks, I I mean this politely, I think you're in trouble. I, I still do. Um, you know, you'd be holding to your vendors. I, Adam, I think you nailed that. Um, and a question. Okay, Adam, you ready? There you go. Yep. Right at you from Sid Rahar. So this is a company founder in San Francisco, probably not that far from you. So Sidrahar says, raising VC money is largely a word of mouth referral game with VCs investing in previously successful entrepreneurs and or those who come warmly recommended. This method has produced remarkable companies and wealth over 50 years. Very true. That said, there are doubtlessly good ideas that are not funded because their founders are not plugged in. Is this still a problem? And how do you remedy this? Do you copy the Y Combinator model or something else? I mean, how are you guys addressing it at point seventy two? How do you find those hidden gems? I guess that's the question, Adam. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to just for my you know year and a half in venture, I, I have to disagree with with that. We take meetings from everyone. Um, you know, we're not only taking in warm introductions or people who have been successful in the past, and we look at every opportunity with with clean eyes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is what, do do we what do we think of the founder? What do we think of the market? What do we think of the product? And and is this a good investment? At, you know, at this stage, at this valuation. Um, so I I think you know more than ever now there are especially in fintech there's fintech angels there's fintech seeds there's fintech series A dedicated funds there's so much competition in venture that um, if you are starting a company in fintech and you're having trouble getting meetings, I, I think I would you know, just sort of try harder. Um, the meetings, I don't think are the hard thing to do. If you're, try if you're having trouble getting funded, that's a whole different story. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it has anything to do with, it, have you done it in the past or not? It probably has something to do with the idea that you're trying to fund. Um, that being said, there's a lot of different VCs out there that are looking for a lot of different things. So you got to keep trying. But, you know, the one thing that's interesting about the whole fintech venture world is that we pass deals around between each other because right. some yep. people see yep. things and some people don't. And it fits into the fund strategy or it doesn't or it's the wrong scale or it's competitive with something in the portfolio. And so there's a, a lot of reasons why a VC is going to say no. And that doesn't mean that another VC right around the corner isn't going to fund that. It's like uh, matchmaking in that perspective. So I do think that there's a, a lot of money out there. There's a lot of access. I don't, I don't see a lot of venture funds turning down auctions at all, even if they're kind of cold. So just keep at it and uh, know that um, you might have to tweak the story or, or tweak the vision if things aren't, aren't working out. Yeah, things change so much. You had mentioned this earlier about how in the world do you get a holistic view of everything that's out there. I mean, um, folks, we, we could do a whole show on acronyms. We could sit here and talk about DeFi to we're blue in the face. There, there's your cool buzzword, everybody. Yeah, um, that's, oh God. I've been trying to dive into <laughs> into Sushi and Yam and, uh, and Uniswap and oh. Yearn and, uh, yeah, we're not we're not heavily invested in uh, in in digital assets or in Bitcoin or blockchain, but it's something that is 
I mean, if you're curious, then it's something to be curious about. That's for sure. Yeah, it's it. it but I, I agree with you, man. I mean, I, you got to constantly read and stay connected. It's just nonstop. But that said, um, if you look out, we, we can we can kind of weave COVID into this. Um, I don't want to say post COVID. I'm so sick of saying that question. What's life going to be like post COVID? Um, if you look out over the next handful of years, what specific areas of fintech really grab you and you think, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there. That's the one that's, these areas are going to take off. Mm. That's hard, isn't it? And don't say DeFi because I just said it because you don't get that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say, <laughs> is it DeFi or is it DeFi? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm 54. Uh, so <laughs> screw it. DeFi. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I think the the most exciting, the, the, I'll, I'll give you two things. One, I'll give you um, the continued disruption of financial services globally. Um, in in outside the United States, um, you know, in Asia, in Africa, in India, in Latin America, these are places where the the incumbent banks are, are probably even slower to react than in the United States. And there's a yeah. lot of opportunity for um, direct to consumer brands and small business brands to be built in those areas. And then the second area that is just super exciting is um, fintech developer platforms. Yep. Um, fintech selling into fintechs, fintech selling into software companies. Uh, you know, the, the best way to think about that is just there's all these, you know, software companies get their start by selling into other tech companies now, right? They're not banging on GE's doors and large enterprises anymore. They're, they're selling to other startups. And there is enough direct to consumer fintechs out there and enough startups that want to launch financial services A, B, or C that you have a good customer base uh, to go after. And so these these financial technology developer platforms that are essentially selling into tech companies are probably the thing I'm most excited about over the next uh, over the next three to five years. And I tell you, and the, and the big boys and girls have seen that, right? I mean, look at the moves like Google Cloud is, is, is moving into and Amazon has already done with AWS and you take your pick, right? Uh, the, the idea of the, the no code solutions or those enterprise solutions yep. and packets. I mean, um, I agree with you. I just think we're going to continue to have these these ecosystems where it's the tools are there and it's that much easier. Um, easier is probably not the right choice of word. It's, it's that much faster to get into market and to get a solution and, and to build something. So personally, I'm well, excited. You, all, you also uh, acquire a customer because for some other reason, and then you yeah. end up selling them a loan or a payment or a bank account or something. So you're not competing directly against yep. the bank for customer acquisition. You got a different mousetrap, but you're making money off of financial services. I think that's the key. So folks, believe it or not, that's it. Adam, I told you, man, 30 minutes flies. By. It's amazing. So we're on the top of the hour. Where's the best place if folks want to reach out to you or learn more about Point72? Best place for them to go? Yeah. Um, if they want to contact me, it's Adam at p72.vc. And if they want to learn more about Point72, it's uh, p p72.vc on the online or Point72 Ventures. Just look it up, uh, navigate to the fintech portfolio. And uh, realize we also invest in AI, we invest in enterprise, and we actually just launched a healthcare fund. So Point72 Ventures is a kind of multi-strategy uh, venture fund and continuing to grow. So watch out watch out for us. <laughs> there you go, folks. I mean, for me, it's Sam Mall on Twitter or Sam at 11FS.com. It's that easy. And that's it for today. Tomorrow, Adam Davis will be joined by Sam White. Hey, finally, a surname I can pronounce. Sam White, who's from Freedom Services Group. They're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. That's it for today, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.